The early 90s were a dark time for James Bond fans. For the first time since the mid-70s, fans had to wait longer than two years for the next 007 adventure, as the film series hung in suspended legal limbo, with only the John Gardner continuation novels and the animated James Bond Jr. series available to satisfy content-starved fans. Satisfy? Despite License to Kill's rather tepid reception with critics and audiences en masse at the time of its release, ranking as one of the lowest-grossing Bond films of all time when figures are adjusted for inflation, Eon Productions was still ready to press forward with another film with Timothy Dalton in the lead role, and various writers were being employed to explore a variety of potential subjects, my favourite being one where Bond would fight an android. I'd love to see how Cubby Broccoli would have spun that one. Well, we're not science fiction, we're in fact science fiction. Fair, you know what, I don't care anymore. Let's just do James Bond versus the Terminator. For more on the concepts explored for Dalton's third Bond film, I can't recommend enough Mark Edlitz's The Lost Adventures of James Bond. But none of these ideas came to fruition as James Bond had to go do battle with his most nefarious, most devious enemies ever. And no, I'm not talking about Spectre, something even worse. Lawyers. Can you imagine a world without lawyers? <laughs> Yeah, MGM's financial situation will be an on and off but mostly on headache for the Bond series, and it's not as if the reasons are as interesting or as juicy as the whole Ian Fleming, Kevin McClory conflicts. It's just the <laughs> companies keep buying MGM and making terrible decisions, but because MGM has a stake in Bond, they need to be on board for the production to go ahead, and when Cubby Broccoli is deciding to sue MGM, things get understandably messy. That's putting it mildly 007. But in a roundabout, butterfly effect sort of way, people like me should really be glad that this all happened. I mean, some businessman tries to sell off the international broadcasting rights to the 007 series in the early 90s, and a few years later, as a result of that, we have Pierce Brosnan as James Bond. You were expecting someone else? Yeah, so Dalton's original Bond contract had expired and the negotiations didn't work out to get him to return, so the series was in the market for a new tuxedo man, and again, in a weird quirk of fate, the gig went back to the man who was originally signed up and then let go immediately prior to Dalton being cast. Pierce Brosnan. But there was also a big shift in personnel behind the camera too. The Bond films of the 80s very much had a, you know, getting the band back together feel with lots of the same principal creatives coming back time and time again. But after six years, there was clearly a sense that things needed a bit of a shake up and refresh. So enter Martin Campbell as director. Action, 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 action. Action, go, 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 go. A bit manic, but, <laughs> but uh... It's totally money. <laughs> but a uh, good director. God, f almighty. I'm not even on the set and I stand to attention every time I hear him shout. Uh, every now and then in the history of James Bond, there is a film on which everything rests. The future of the series in 1995 was down to Goldeneye. If this film hadn't been a hit, the series could well have ended here. Obviously it didn't, and Goldeneye went on to be a huge success with a really lasting legacy, thanks in large part to the game it spawned, but also just down to the fact that it's one of those Bond films that I think really connected with the general public. I think it's up there with the likes of Goldfinger and Casino Royale in terms of public awareness, and it's often spoken of in high regard, but why? Why has this film connected so much with its audience? Why has Goldeneye become almost a brand unto itself outside of Bond? Why is it the iconic thing that it is? Why? 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 Oh, you keep out of this! I'll tell you why. Good evening, Mr. Bond fans. I will indeed do my best to explain why as we take an in-depth look at Goldeneye. The film begins with what is, to my mind, the perfectly updated gun barrel for the CGI age. It retains the iconic look of the Maurice Binder design while giving it a wonderful smoothness and depth, and Brosnan just absolutely nails the walk, turn, and shoot. It is just about faultless to my mind, and that sentiment extends into the next few minutes as we are treated to one heck of an awesome stunt to open the film, the famous damn bungee jump. It's such a take your breath away moment. It's something I adore seeing on the big screen whenever I see this film in cinemas. Uh, usually these Bond pre-title sequences end with the big show-stopping stunt, but the fact that this one begins with it is so great it creates an anticipation for what they could possibly do to top this. 
Interestingly enough, the film was not always intended to begin this exact same way. Ever wondered exactly how Bond got that gate open on the dam? <laughs> well, no, me neither, but you can see how in a deleted scene on the Blu-ray where he infiltrates a patrol shack and Hey, it's a really short bit and would probably be very unintrusive if it was in the film, but I just love the opening shot and how we stay with the dam for these opening minutes. Also noteworthy is that as a result of these scenes being cut, we actually get a different couple of first shots of Brosnan in the film. I mean, obviously he's there in the gun barrel, but it's weird to think that this could have been the first real shot we got of the guy in the film. I love how they tease his eventual reveal too, he's in the shadows, we just see his piercing eyes, yes pun intended. It creates quite an ominous figure, particularly this shot where he's about to infiltrate the toilets. It's almost scary, really. Is there a name for the very specific fear of being watched by Pierce Brosnan from above while you're on the toilet? If so, I think I might have it. I haven't been able to sit on a toilet in peace for years. Just as an aside, it is quite brave of the filmmakers to introduce a new Bond to the world in such an unglamorous way. I mean, literally upside down in a grotty bathroom. It's uh, hardly as glamorous as what Sean Connery got, for goodness sake. And yet it totally works for this film. And There are enough badass shots of Pierce coming up, and yeah, I mean, he couldn't look more the part here. As an introduction to him as James Bond, I think this sequence is quite terrific. Anyway, Bond is infiltrating the Archangel Chemical Weapons Facility in the USSR, immediately placing the timeline back from when the film was released in 1995. GoldenEye is, of course, the first Bond film to be released after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and as the character is something of a Western Cold War hero, I suppose that this was the filmmakers giving audiences a final taste of that conflict before moving along with the times for the rest of the film. I mean, with the Soviet Union gone, it's not as if we're going to be fighting the Russians again anytime soon, is it? Anyway, time for me to take a sip from this positively brimming glass of martini while making my next move in this precarious solo game of Jenga while the cat sleeps soundly just at the other side of the table. The other one stuff. Could you fashion? Because it seems like all double-O agents need to be introduced like horror movie characters in this film, the man providing the jump scare here is Alec Trevelyan, 006, played by Sean Bean. James? For England. For England, Alec. Fun fact, this scene was actually redubbed in post-production after filmmakers decided to do away with Sean Bean's natural northern accent. You can see the original version of the scene on the Blu-ray. James? Do it for Yorkshire! For England, Alec. It's really cool seeing James Bond on a full-on mission with another 00 agent. We've seen and heard of other 00s in the past, but this was really the first time seeing Bond out with a contemporary, and Sean Bean is just the most perfect casting. Apparently he was up for the role of Bond himself, and it's easy to see why. He's just as smooth, cool, and dangerous as Pierce Brosnan is in this opening. There's even a slightly shocking moment where we see him kill an unsuspecting scientist in cold blood with a shot to the back. It's a really small thing, but it is kind of brutal. I mean, sure, we've seen Bond kill in cold blood before, but usually unarmed scientist-type characters get off a bit lighter, like they just get knocked knocked out with a bash to the back of the head. I've always wondered if this is why in the GoldenEye video game they actually let you kill an innocent scientist or two before it constitutes a mission failure. The agents are there to destroy the facility when action kicks off as their presence alerts the guards, led by a General Arkady Orumov, played by Gottfried John, who, as it turns out, is really good at his job. He apprehends 006 in record timing. Uh, seeing his friend held at gunpoint like that, Bond puts his gun down and fully intends on surrendering himself, so it's seems odd that Orumov decides to execute Alec there and then. Given the breakneck pace of events in this sequence, Bond isn't really allowed time to mourn his fallen comrade, but I just want to point out that there is this single shot of Brosnan that I think does really well to convey a lot of pain in a short space of time. It's such an unusual look. I, I've seen many Brosnan films, and I don't think I've ever seen him make this kind of face in any other film I've seen him in. His face is somewhat transformed in that moment, but it's really effective. I also love Bond's whole escape here, the squeaky wheel on the container of canisters, the looks of surprise and baffled amusement on Orumov's face, like he's just thinking, what in the St. Mark Square is this guy doing? The following escape chase is great too, I'm not entirely sure how this exterior shot of the facility matches up with the exterior shot of the dam we saw earlier on, like, 
How the hell did Bond end up on a mountain after diving down from the dam to just be going constantly lower and lower as he progresses through the building? Unless that passageway Bond and Alec took involved some kind of crazy uphill climb that we just weren't privy to. Alec, why didn't we just start from this end to begin with? The sequence ends with a really cool escalation of the bungee jump stunt from earlier, but this time 007 is making the jump off of the back of a motorbike without a bungee, falling after a plane. Obviously, there's some special effects at play here. <laughs> no, really, I swear to you there is. So the moment doesn't have quite the same take-your-breath-away quality as the initial bungee jump, I don't think. But it's a really cool note to end the sequence on all the same, as Bond flies away from the exploding factory and into the opening title sequence. After three decades of Maurice Binder supremacy, the death of the title designer in 1991 meant that Daniel Kleiman was brought on board to produce GoldenEye's title sequence. And it's just sheer brilliance. It maintains the style pioneered by Maurice Binder, but uses updated technology to become the first, I think, truly modern Bond title sequence. So much imagery here that I just absolutely love. The smoking two-headed woman with the gun coming out of her mouth is a real favourite, and there's some really nicely timed visuals to the Tina Turner song, which is just so slinky and seductive it makes me want to buy it a drink. And hey, good on Sean Bean. To say he only had four minutes of screen time, he gets second billing in the credits. That man must have one hell of an agent. Anyway, on with the film as events pick up nine years later, and boy, isn't Bond looking great. I mean, hardly aged today. The agent is under evaluation by Caroline, played by Serena Gordon. It's not explicit, but it could certainly be read as a bit of continuity from License to Kill, where Bond, of course, left active duty to pursue a personal revenge mission. Now, this could be read as his final test before returning to active service. Not quite sure what the evaluation quota this particular task is fulfilled, but hey, lovely to see Bond behind the wheel of a DB5 again, which he proceeds to use in a drag race with a mysterious, sexy, dangerous looking woman in a bright red Ferrari. This is a fun sequence and it's just a blast seeing these two cars go at it and Bond flirting with the woman. Caroline is no Sheriff Pepper in the comedic relief department, but I suppose that it would have been a bit of a stretch to contrive a way for the Louisiana policeman to be in Cannes. The chase comes to an abrupt end when Caroline puts her foot down and sure enough, Bond decides that he's going to seduce his co-worker, making use of the db 5 champagne cooler. Only one glass there, though. Is he is he gonna make Caroline chug it from the bottle? It's so in character for Bond to shag his way to evaluation success, but I think that the fault for this lies squarely at M's door. I mean, you know what this guy is like. Why did you send an attractive young woman along for the job? I mean, if I'd have had any say in it, I'd have been sending MI6's most ugly, repugnant man along for the gig, but anyway. What do you mean Ebenezer Ratbag's on annual leave? Oh, well, fine. Uh, what about John Rancid Veg? No? Uh, Carl Fartfingers? Uh, Tom Urinal Cake? All away? Oh, fine. Just send Caroline lovely ass and be done with it. Later in the evening, Bond heads to the casino, which gives the character a good excuse to gussy up so we can admire just how damn good Pierce looks in a tuxedo. It's like a second skin on the man. Anyway, as chances would have it, he once again bumps into the Ferrari lady, who it turns out is Xenia Onatop, played by Famke Janssen. The pair play cards and spar a little bit, though any kind of real tension between the two is somewhat undercut by the rather romantic score music which seems a bit at odds with some of the dialogue and acting. I mean, don't get me wrong, there is obviously some flirting going on here, but it's somewhat aggressive, and Xenia's acting kind of pissed off, and Bond is clearly sussing her out, uh, noticing a discrepancy in her Ferrari's registration plate. He knows that something's up with this lady, but the music chooses very much to play up the romance of the scene, and I'm not quite sure if it's even really there. I'll get to talking about the music more broadly later on, but sure enough, the score to Goldeneye is one of the more dogged-on aspects of this film amongst the Bond fandom. Though to composer Eric Serra's credit on the audio commentary for the film, director Martin Campbell says that, yeah, actually, during this scene, you are supposed to think that Xenia is indeed being set up as the main Bond girl. Because right here, you don't know whether she's good or bad. You know, you're well, do you think she's sure. going to be the lead girl, I think? Yeah. Don't you? You think, God, this is going to be the Bond girl. This is going to be the uh, woman in his uh, 
life. So okay, maybe the music was exactly how Martin Campbell wanted it, but I don't know, there's still a certain aggressiveness to the performances that, I don't know, it just doesn't quite match with the tone of the music for me. Xenia just absolutely oozes villainy, and I think it's a really great performance that Famke Janssen is giving throughout this film, and I'll get to praising her more later on, but in this sequence, I'm never for once lulled into the idea that, yeah, she could be the, the nice main Bond girl of the film. Bond follows after Xenia and her Canadian Admiral date and spies them heading back to a yacht together. According to a transmission from Moneypenny, Xenia is an ex-Soviet fighter pilot with links to a crime syndicate known as Yanis. We then abruptly cut to probably the most overtly sexual scene in all of Bond, well, to this point at least, as Xenia gets it on with her Admiral fella, who looks to be having a mighty great time for the most part, uh, until she decides to suffocate him with her thighs. It's a wild scene, and back when I was a preteen watching this film, you know, if my parents were in the room, it was always a convenient moment to get up and leave and do anything else for the next couple of minutes. I, I think I'll just uh, pop toilet on and nip to the kettle. I can pause it if you'd like. No, it's fine. This thing was initially rated 12 in the UK for the longest time, and with this scene intact as it is, and I kinda can't believe that, like, sure, you don't actually see any actual nudity, but just how these actors are playing it, it's a pretty kinky scene for a James Bond film, and I mean, I do think it features one of the best cuts in Bond history as we go from Xenia screaming in pleasure to... Well, water frothing up, and uh, I'm no expert, but I think that there might be some subtle subtext to that. The next day, Bond decides to investigate the boat, and you know, we're only 25 minutes into the film, but boy, does it hit a lot of Bond tropes in a very quick succession. I mean, we've seen him in action, we've seen show-stopping stunts, we've seen Aston Martin, Casino, Tuxedo, Martini, Bond, James Bond, seducing a woman using gadgets, and now we have him doing some stealthy investigating, and yet, it never feels overwhelming or like it's arbitrarily hitting these beats. It just feels so natural having Brosnan in this leading role doing these things, it's progressing the story. I think his performance gets better as his films go along, and he gains more and more confidence, but here, even at the very beginning, he's doing so great, it doesn't feel at all like an awkward first time outing. Small moment to point out here, but I do just love how he gets into a little fight on the boat, and he uses the towel as a weapon, and then he uses that very same towel to dab his brow afterwards. It's just a lovely little Bondian touch. His investigation ultimately leads to the discovery of the deceased Admiral, who at least went out with a smile on his face. Um, again, I can't believe that they actually got this into a once 12 rated film here in the UK, but anyway. So meanwhile, Xenia has headed over to a military presentation for a new stealth helicopter. So, bit of an underdeveloped plot point here. When we saw Xenia killing the Canadian Admiral earlier, in the foreground of a shot, we saw a hand slipping the Admiral's ID out of his coat pocket. When Xenia arrives at this event, the ID card is handed over, and from behind we see a figure who looks very much like the Admiral to me, I'm assuming that it's even the same actor. The implication here is, I guess, something similar to what we saw in Thunderball. In order to carry out their hijacking scheme, the villains have deployed the use of a really convincing double. I just find it weird that it's kind of a very much glossed over element of the story. He's literally just there to get Xenia into the event and then co-pilot the helicopter out of there with her, but we never see him again for the rest of the film. He doesn't follow Xenia to her next location, nor is he seen in the villain's base during the climax. Presumably, he just carries out his duties in these few scenes and then moves along, but does that by default make him one of the most successful henchmen in all of Bond? Hello, henchman hotline, how can I help you? Oh, no, I'm sorry, our Canadian Admiral Impersonator has been fully booked for the next three years, I'm afraid. Yes, no, he's been very popular recently. You've no idea, phone's been ringing off the hook for weeks now. Sure enough, Xenia and the Impersonator make it away with the helicopter, and Bond is powerless to stop. A mighty fine coincidence that he was even in the area to begin with when considering all of this that he has been witness to, though, huh? Yeah, it is somewhat odd and contrived to think that Bond gets caught up in this whole scheme seemingly by accident. I mean, if Xenia hadn't got into that drag race with Bond, would he have been aware of any of this going on? I mean, especially considering who Xenia ends up working for. I am very much surprised that she wasn't completely warned off Bond. Like, the one man on Earth you don't want sniffing around this particular evil scheme, and you're just gonna catch his attention and have a fun little drag race. I mean, unless we're to extrapolate that Xenia's just so much of a troublemaker that even she couldn't resist the thought of 
dangling her nefariousness in front of the guy. And yet, I'm nonetheless very glad that Bond is here during this entire sequence, otherwise we'd have ended up going a heck of a long time without the leading man on screen while all this setup is taking place. Back in the Roger era, this would totally have been like a five minute tangent of the pre-title sequence without Bond there, just like, you know, the stealing of the Moonraker shuttle, the sinking of the ATAC, the swallowing of the submarine, and those sequences all work in those contexts, but particularly with this being the first Bond movie in six years at that time, I appreciate that the filmmakers want to get Bond on screen as much as possible. Is it contrived? Sure, but I'm having a great time and I've got Contrivatini on tap, so bottoms up, folks. And for those of you who can't stand Pierce Brosnan's face on screen, congrats! We now have a whole tangent of him not being in the film as the action moves to the Space Weapons Control Center in Sevenaya, Russia, to introduce us to programmer Natalia Simeonova, played by Isabella Skorupko, and pervert Boris Grishin, co-played by Alan Cumming. The pair are colleagues, and their banter serves to set up a couple of elements that will become bigger plot points later on, Boris sending a spike to the FBI, and his penchant for naughty passwords. All right, I'll give you a hint. They're right in front of you, and can open very large doors. Such a geek. Well, that wouldn't cut it in this day and age. Add a number and punctuation mark to that password, please. Boris heads out for a cigarette, and things really kick off when the Tiger helicopter appears and Zenya and Orumov step out of it. The pair proceed to initiate a war simulation test. The Russians have two satellites orbiting the Earth that can be controlled through use of the GoldenEye device and keys. Zenya proceeds to kill everyone once they get the GoldenEye, and again, this film must have been really pushing the limits on what they could get into a 12-rated film here in the UK, because because then you're practically having an orgasm after mowing down two dozen people with an AK-47 is pretty damn dark, and it's quite a harrowing scene. I don't know why, but the bullet shot sounds in this film really cut through to the bone. Natalia is the only survivor of the attack, but one of her dying colleagues is able to raise the alarm. I just love this bit, by the way, where Xenia investigates the sound that Natalia made in the kitchen, and Natalia's hidden away, and it's a really nice, tense moment, and Xenia is damn scary in this. Uh, she and Oromov set Servanaya as a target for one of the satellites, and then make off with the golden eye and keys. This is when we cut back to Bond who is at MI6 in London, and we meet a new money penny played by Samantha Bond. I really love this scene. It's very determined to present a different Bond money penny scene from what you might be used to. Gone is the usual three-wall set feel, but instead the camera is in handheld and it's going through the rooms as the pair walk and talk, money penny having returned to the office from a date. The dialogue is quite spicy between them too. There's a an edge to the scene, like they're flirting clearly, but dropping like you know sexual harassment into the conversation. The fact that money penny was on a date and is Bond jealous or is he not? It's all delivered in a very knowing way, which I really like, and for me harkens back to the glory days of Connery and Maxwell's chemistry, and you know, after the last few films when they kind of turned the character into a bit of a fawning caricature. I think it's a much appreciated return to form. The only thing that I do not like about this scene is the very ending. The look on Brosnan's face as he walks away from Money Penny. For the most part, I think that the pair banter very knowingly, like I say, but you know, Bond isn't actually devastated that Money Penny was on a date, nor is she actually going to report him for sexual harassment. But this bit at the very end where he goes off pouting, it's kind of weird because it seems like he's suddenly genuinely pissed off with her and it kills the bantery feel of the thing. Like, Come on, mate, cheer up. She's not actually going to take you to HR. Anyway, Bond meets with Bill Tanner, played by Michael Kitchen, in the Situation Room. Satellites picked up the Tiger helicopter in Servanaya, so now MI6 is doing some digging. The scene also serves to introduce us to a brand new M, played, of course, by Judi Dench in one of the best casting decisions in the entire series, for my money. And she is very much introduced as the new M, making it the first time in the series that they properly acknowledged a passing of the torch from one character to another. I like to think of Bernard Lee and Robert Brown's M's as separate characters, but it's never explicitly stated in the series. But here it's like, oh wow, who's the new lady and why is she so pissed off? Because if I want sarcasm, Mr. Tanner, I'll talk to my children, thank you very much. She does indeed come in all guns blazing. I just want a workplace sitcom where it's her having a go at Tanner every couple of minutes. They do this thing where they set her up as the evil queen of numbers, as Tanner puts it, and it's a setup that kind of only exists within this film, like the idea that she's driven by statistical analysis and spreadsheets, there's no real 
arc to it. Uh, I, I guess that they thought that they might expand on it in future films, but it never really becomes much of a thing beyond Goldeneye itself. It is interesting, though, that she's actually wrong about the Servanaya facility and whether Goldeneye truly exists. It gives Bond a reason to be somewhat skeptical of her, and indeed, I think as an audience, we're perhaps not to fully trust her right away. Given how the rest of her tenure during the Brosnan era goes, I'm slightly disappointed that they didn't give the character a more complete arc in this film. But hey, I mean, come on, it's Judy Dench. Obviously, she plays the part superbly and goes on to be one of the strongest recurring characters in the series, and she goes on to deliver one of my favourite lines in this film. Unlike the American government, we prefer not to get our bad news from CNN. Anyway, MI6 have picked up the location of the stolen Tiger helicopter, as well as three Russian MiGs that are heading there in response to the distress call. By the way, just superb effects work here, uh, from the standees in the background of this shot to the models taking off. This is just so convincing. My mind was blown when I discovered that these weren't at all real full-scale fighter jets. Meanwhile, Natalia continues to have the worst day at work imaginable. Oh man, I knew I should have taken that desk job in Moscow. As one of the GoldenEye satellites is set off, creating an electromagnetic pulse that causes absolute pandemonium, and Natalia uses up every coin of good karma she has acquired over her life to stay alive through all this. Uh, yeah, sorry love, you're getting no karma change from this. I know it's still early in the film, but just to talk about Natalia a bit more broadly, I absolutely adore this character, and she's one of my favourite Bond girls ever. I mean, sure, she's not one of the great loves of Bond's life, like Tracy or Vesper or... Well, either of those two, but she's always felt so real to me. Like, don't get me wrong, I love Bond for its grandiose, larger than lifeness, but she has always felt like one of the more real, relatable characters to be paired up with Bond. We see her at work, wearing fairly regular clothes. She has a skill set and she's a programming whiz, but not in a fantastical nuclear scientist kind of way. And as much as I love Denise Richards as Dr. Christmas Jones, it is a different thing with Natalia. She's resilient, tough, and smart, but in a grounded, genuine way, and I kind of adore her for that. Isabella Skorupko is an interesting actress too. She had a few roles in the 90s and 2000s, but she never seemed like she particularly aspired to be in the Hollywood limelight. I mean, she reportedly turned down the Catherine Zeta-Jones role in Zorro and the Kim Basinger role in LA Confidential, and when you read up on her rather eclectic career, you get the sense that she very much marches to the beat of her own drum, and I respect and admire her a lot for that. And if you also follow her on Instagram, you will know that she has made some kind of deal with the devil or something because she has hardly aged at all. She is just one of the most gorgeous human beings on the planet. So Natalia escapes the wreckage while MI6 spot her from one of their satellites. The seeming confirmation that Goldeneye exists is a red face moment for M, which adds a certain spice to her briefing with Bond as she delivers some of the most quoted lines in the entire series, giving him a real dressing down. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. A relic of the Cold War. Similar to the Money Penny scene earlier on, a lot of this feels like it is the film kind of calling itself out on some of the uh, more common observations regarding Bond in relation to the changing social attitudes of the time. And it's certainly not the first time the series would be self-referential like this regarding Bond's relationship with women. James Bond, who only has to make love to a woman and she starts to hear heavenly choir singing. But it is one of the more overt instances of it, and it makes perfect sense in this context, with the new M being a woman, Bond having to take orders from her. I think it's a really great setup for character drama. But sadly, this is all the film will do with it. They chug some Jack Daniels, and she tells Bond to find the golden eye. They have a moment to display some grudging tolerance of one another, and then that's it. M's out for the rest of the film. Before leaving, Bond visits Q Branch, where good old Desmond Llewellyn has survived the casting shakeup, and we are damn lucky he did, because this, for my money, is one of the best Q scenes of the series. There's such a terrific energy to it, a snappiness to the dialogue, funny background gags, it's about as perfect as one of these scenes can get for me. And I think that Q himself is just written and performed to perfection as well. I've talked in the reviews for the Dalton films about the pivot from Q being a perpetually pissed off civil servant to a more wacky inventor uncle type, and here I think there's a wonderful blend of the two styles. He's very giddy about some of his inventions and taking great pride in explaining them. There's a glint in his eye, but he's still happy to make a withering remark to Bond every once in a while to put him in his place. Desmond just looks to be having so much fun here too. There are moments where you can clearly tell that he's reading dialogue from a Q card off screen, and you know, his eyes are clearly not on Bond in some of these shots, but who cares? I kind of like that it seems like he's just distracted during the briefing, like he's more interested in something that's going on behind Bond. Or perhaps he's just ogling the wonderful sight of the BMW Z3 with its 
making a missiles. Good lord, I can't wait to see those things put to use later in the film. And the scene ends on one of my favourite Q gag gadgets ever. Don't touch that! It's my lunch. Meanwhile, Back in the USSR. General Oromov meets with Defense Minister Mishkin to be all like, don't worry about the whole GoldenEye thing, fellas, it's all cool, while Mishkin drops the bomb that as well as Boris, there is another missing survivor of the Servanaya attack, prompting a mm-hmm, <laughs> cola tug moment for Oromov. Just as an aside, Mishkin is a relatively minor role, but very well and stoically played by Cheki Cario, but this part was supposedly originally earmarked for a returning John Reese Davis as General Pushkin from The Living Daylights. I would have loved this little bit of continuity, and it would have made an awful lot of sense given that the character is essentially the new General Gogol, but sadly it wasn't to be, and I mean, hey, maybe that's for the best given how things go down for Mishkin later on. And speaking of replacements for series regulars, as well as returning cast members from The Living Daylights, Lights, weirdly enough, Bond meets with Jack Wade here, played by Joe Don Baker, who previously played the main villain Whitaker in the first Dalton Bond film. The character reappears in Tomorrow Never Dies as well and is very much a Felix Leiter substitute. The CIA contact, give Bond some intel and get him from A to B. Wade is very entertaining with his no-nonsense demeanor and his banged up car and much like M, he's not afraid of giving Bond a dressing down. If I cry out loud, another stiff-ass Brit, your secret codes and your passwords. <laughs> and weirdly enough, Bond isn't shy about giving Wade a dressing down in the literal sense. Show me the rose. Huh? But despite the initial antagonism, he softens towards Bond quickly as the pair stop in a roundabout cul-de-sac of some kind. Are these cars just driving around and round in circles? There's no exit for them to escape. Wade passes on some Yanis Syndicate intel before he takes Bond to meet with Valentin Zukovsky, an all-time favourite Bond ally played brilliantly by Robbie Coltrane. I'll admit that story-wise on paper, this is a bit of a dull spot in the film. There's a whole heap of exposition dumping going on and Bond is essentially going from guy to guy to gal to get to the guy that he actually wants to get to. However, it is entirely the characters that make these scenes as fun as they are. Zukovsky being an absolute highlight. He has some cracking lines, very funny moments, great chemistry with Brosnan, and he manages to make some rather dry exposition palatable. What do you expect from a Cossack? Who? As much as I adore this film and know it so well, the Ligon's Cossack thing does slip my mind every once in a while. Like, don't get me wrong, it is explained in the dialogue quite clearly and it's going to be a very important part of the main villain's motivation, but I just, I don't know if it ever really hits quite as well as it should. It's a tough thing in the Zukovsky scene in particular because they're talking about all of this obviously in relation to the head of Yanis, a character that we have not yet met and yet here we are hearing all about his backstory, which includes a bit of a history lesson. I think they just about get away with it, but I do often wonder if there's a more fun and engaging way for them to get this information across. Dos vidanya! I'm a Lien's Cossack! No, 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 no. Not that fun. The whole Lien's Cossack thing, well presented a little dryly in the film, is nonetheless good villainous character backstory, and dare I say, very Fleming-esque. It's the kind of detail based in real world history I could imagine Fleming writing into one of his stories. And indeed, I think it's the kind of detail that would probably come across a bit better on the page of a book than dialogue on screen. And I say all this without really knowing how they could have made it more palatable. Uh, I mean, ideally they would have made it more visual in some way. At this time, Bond didn't really go in for the flashbacks all that much. And I guess it would have seemed a bit odd if Sikovsky had brought out some pre-prepared visual aids from under his desk to punctuate his story. So, eh, okay, it is what it is. And hey, it's a still a better villainous motivation than what they updated it to for the GoldenEye Reloaded video game. Why? Look at the last 10 years. The wars, the financial meltdown. Who profited? Who came out on top? You thought you were protecting queen and country, but it's all about the bankers and their bonuses. Now that's a villainous motivation I can get behind. Where do I sign up? While all this is going on, we follow the further adventures of Natalia as she does her own digging into what happened at the Servanaya facility, and by George Lazenby, she's actually really good at this stuff. I, I love this bit where she poses as someone looking to buy computers for a couple of schools, and the demeanour of the shop owner changing in seconds when he realises he has a potentially large sale on his hands, it always makes me smile. But yeah, she succeeds here and actually makes contact with Boris, who it turns out is a wrong and I mean, who'd have thought he seemed like a totally harmless pervert? 
As a result of a deal with Zukovsky, Bond is relaxing at his hotel when his scheduled Yanis contact turns up, and what do you know, it's Xenia, who immediately starts coming on to Bond, and despite knowing exactly what she did to that Canadian Admiral earlier on, Bond is still like, yeah, well, the guy did have a massive grin on his face for a reason, so let's find out what that's all about, but no such luck for Bond, alas. How about we turn that pain face upside down, Commander? There's a brief scuffle in which Bond gets the upper hand, and I love the bit where he just knocks out some dude. <laughs> like, I don't know who this guy's supposed to be. He might well have just been inquiring about the noise, but gets concussion instead. Do you mind keeping it down? I was having a relaxing massage. <laughs> Xenia takes Bond to Yanis's um, hideout? Hangout? Cruising ground? Whatever it is, it's a phenomenal spot. Like a statue graveyard for old Soviet monuments, providing a perfect backdrop for the reveal that the head of Yanis, the man behind all this nefariousness, is Alec Trevelyan 006 himself. The shock, the surprise, the drama, for those of us who didn't see the original theatrical trailer at least. And this time, 007 is facing the ultimate enemy. Hello, James. What an unpleasant surprise. 006. Still, it's a great twist. 007 versus 006 as the main baddie? Like, that's just absolutely perfect. No wonder they promoted this thing on the back of that concept, but we do need to rewind and ask a few questions. So, this whole thing certainly changes perceptions about that pre-title sequence. Like, obviously the whole thing in that title sequence was a ruse to make Bond believe that Alec died, presumably so that Alec could be out of the limelight while going about doing his evil things. Um, Orumov is clearly in on it with Alec, and I guess he fired a blank or a fake gun or something, but don't we see him use the same weapon to kill that soldier? I guess he could have always switched it out for a similar but real gun. I mean, Alec must have been damn pleased that he didn't get them mixed up. So just to clarify one more time, Orumov, the gun on the left is the real one, the gun on the right is the fake one. But wait, is that your left or my left? Or maybe it was all just one real gun and Orumov fired past Alec's head, but from the angle that Bond was at it looked like he shot him directly in the head, or maybe it was all a fake gun and this guy was in on it too, but I just assumed that it's only Alec and Orumov in on the evil scheme, like it'd be too many people to keep quiet otherwise, wouldn't it? Or maybe these guards are all indeed secretly working for Alec, I mean they must have been mighty pissed off that some of their friends are apparently mowed down in this whole debacle then. And then there's the question of, if they wanted Bond to escape, why did they make it so bloody hard for him to get away? Presumably they didn't actually want to kill him, otherwise they could have done that quite easily when he was surrendering. I mean, I do kind of like the idea that Bond surrendering so quickly wasn't actually a part of Alec's plan, which is why Orumov goes ahead and fake kills him, even though Bond is really, presumably, playing right into their hands in that moment. I also love that Alec now has some facial scarring as a result of Bond setting the detonators for three minutes rather than the planned six, so presumably he just didn't get out of the facility in time. It's a trope of Bond villains that there is usually some kind of disfigurement, and it's interesting to have one that Bond actually causes. I would just have loved to have seen the look on Alec's face when the whole thing blew up ahead of schedule. Ugh, well, that all went remarkably well, didn't it? And oh, look, three whole minutes to spend! My reason for covering all of this is that, yeah, I mean, it is a stretch when you think about it realistically. You have to buy some serious leaps of logic to go with this, but hey, in the context of this film alone, I'm having an awful lot of fun, and I am just kind of happy rolling along with this. I've got plenty contrivatini to keep me going for, uh... Well, another hour or so, at least. It does surprise me a bit that Bond doesn't immediately lead with. Sorry, but can we roll back a few years? Because I really need to know how you pulled all that off. But no, they talk some more about Alec's motivations. The fact that MI6 knew he was Aliens Cossack, but recruited him anyway. There's a nice mention of Bond's parents having died in a climbing accident, which is lifted straight from Fleming. I think that both actors play this scene really well. It plays very much like Bond seeing himself reflected in a broken mirror. The similarities between the two, but then there are these details ideological differences a result of their very different but still tragic upbringings. It's a shame that the score music is so weirdly saccharine. I get that it's going for sentimentality and emotion, but it plays almost romantic, and I would have thought that something that highlighted the tragedy and tension of the situation would have been more appropriate. I'm very aware that I've just complained about the score for the most part so far, but believe me, I do have positives, just stay tuned. Bond is knocked out, and when he wakes up, he and Natalia are restrained in the Tiger helicopter, which fires its missiles at itself. Pretty tidy example of two birds with one stone on Alex's part there, like, get rid of the evidence as well as the witnesses to your crime in one fell swoop. Bond uses his head to get out of the situation, 
and it's a real fault on Alex's part that he didn't just disable that or cover up the big eject button, but this is the first time that Bond and the main Bond woman of the film are meeting. I'm sure that in an instant Natalia will be doing that classic Bond girl thing of melting in the man's arms. That's it. Mind your head. I love that moment so much. I love it too when Bond tries a quip and it's just completely lost on her. The pair are quickly captured, but this time it's by Russian officials and they have a quiet few moments in a cell to connect with each other. Natalia is behaving understandably like a mistreated puppy in this situation and Bond has to win her over here. I think that both actors are really strong in this scene. Bond goes in very tough and he's at a point where he just wants to get to the bottom of this whole thing and just delivers a set of very blunt questions, but his determination in doing this seems to win Natalia around. He's gaining her trust by asking all the right things with such a steely conviction. Mishkin eventually enters and the conversation escalates before Natalia gets to the end of her tether with the men. Oh, stop it, both of you! Stop it! You're like boys with toys. Natalia reveals all to Mishkin, who seemingly has his suspicions about Orumov confirmed. I mean, she has no hard evidence for what she's saying, but based on the scene with Orumov and Mishkin earlier, it's clear that Mishkin thinks that Orumov is up to no good, and what she is saying here is just music to his ears. So it's kind of awkward when a drunken and disheveled Orumov turns up and kills Mishkin, and he's clearly losing it here and improving on the fly, but I just kind of love it, the desperation that he's conveying here. Bond and Natalia, of course, escape and we begin one of the film's most memorable extended action sequences, starting with a huge gunfight in the archives building, and I just love how energetic and kinetic this whole thing is. There's a dynamism to the camera work and the editing, and this carries through to the absolute show-stopping iconic brilliance of the tank chase through the streets of St. Petersburg as Bond pursues Orumov and the captured Natalia. There's a reason why driving a tank became something of a semi-staple of James Bond video games of the era. This sequence left such a lasting impact on, well, I would certainly say people of my generation seeing the film. I even remember around the time of the 40th anniversary of the series, ITV here in the UK were doing a program on the best Bond moments, and they gave you a list of 10 uh, Bond scenes where you could phone in and vote for your favourite, and they would announce the winner on the program, and so I added about 20p to my parents' phone bill by phoning up and voting for the Golden Eye Tank Chase. And I do indeed still have a TV magazine from that very week leading up to the program, which has a two-page spread. <laughs> with the with the 10 moments and my vote must have counted for something because the tank chase ended up coming number four out of 10 just before Honey Rider emerging from the sea and the Thames chase from the world is not enough and just in case you were wondering it was the Goldfinger laser scene that won the best ever Bond scene on that program but damn it I was still happy to see the golden eye tank chase recognized another factor of the production that just continues to blow my mind to this day the second unit actually shot a bunch of stuff for this film in Russia itself, and just those shots blend in so well with the set-based stuff that they obviously need for the more complicated shots and stunts, but it's just the fact that James Bond, Western Cold War hero James Bond, was filming in actual Russia, well, or at least his second unit was, but so soon after the collapse of the Soviet Union, this is kind of crazy, and particularly in the world we live in now, hard to imagine ever happening again, but it lends this sequence such an authenticity. Brosnan just looks so damn cool during this whole bit too, it's an outrageous bit of action at just the right point in the film, the moments of humour peppered in work great, especially Orimov getting absolutely tanked while being pursued by a tank. Okay, so maybe now is a good time to talk music over the sequence with music not actually composed by the credited composer Eric Serra, but actually by John Altman, which certainly explains why it sounds completely different to anything else in the score, and sure enough, the Eric Serra track that was originally composed for this sequence can be heard on the soundtrack release, and the story behind it being replaced is actually pretty interesting. Martin Campbell is quoted in this ING article as saying, In all honesty, I was disappointed in the music. Our budget was not that much and it was limited to what we could do. And when I was dubbing the tank chase, the music that came in for that was in exactly the same register as the tanks. In other words, it disappeared. So I rang Eric in France and said, look, we have a real problem here. I remember saying to him, there's no point in using synth for this because it'll just disappear. I said, what we need is the Bond theme and you always use percussion and brass to crash through all the effects. And I remember his answer to me was, well, lower the effects. So I said, I'm not going to do that, and that was the end of our conversation. 
been on a real journey with this score over the years. Like, back when I was a kid watching this film, I really liked the music, or at least I never questioned it, and to this day I still really like the, like, industrial-sounding Bond theme that plays a few points. And then I became a bit more involved with Bond fandom and, you know, reading books and lurking on forums and all that kind of stuff, and, yeah, you would see people slagging this score off quite a lot. And so then I'd go back and watch the film and think, like, oh yeah, I'm not quite sure that that track quite works with that scene, or like, oh yeah, that, that noise that plays when Xenia appears in her uh, red sports car isn't particularly nice to listen to. But now after all these years, I've kind of come back out the other way, and now I actually really like this score, or at least I, it's such a part of this film's DNA and unique appeal that I wouldn't want the film without it. Though I do probably have to caveat that by saying that, yeah, I mean, in terms of a soundtrack, I don't really stick this one on all that much, beyond maybe a track or two. It's a really different sound to the rest of the Bond series, but I think I quite like it for that. It helps give this film something of its own identity, and there's just something so austere about the soundtrack, I suppose, that really gels with the fallen Soviet Union aspects of the film. So I guess these days I'd largely identify as being more positive about this soundtrack than I have been in the past few years, though I am, of course, making an exception for the awful song that plays over the end credits. The experience of love, more like the experience of, oh my god, hit the menu button and let's get out of this film. Christ, wait, what do you mean the remote needs new batteries? Turn it off somehow, for God's sake! <laughs> So Oromov makes it to the Yanis armored train where a dress to massacre Xenia is waiting. She's aggressively sexy in everything she wears in this film, but this in particular I think is just absolutely brilliant costume design. This little number in particular is from Chanel's killing your loved ones in front of you and microwaving the family cat range. Bond is able to spy on the trio from his tank, which is far from the most subtle of vantage points, admittedly, but how the hell did he get up there anyway? That bridge must be pretty well enforced if it's holding a tank. As far as villains' lairs go, I think of the upcoming satellite dish as Trevelyan's de facto base, but this armoured train is just crazy cool, a brilliant design, and filmed really well to hide the fact that it's not actually that big, it is just three carriages, but the way that they hide its limits is impressive, and I don't know if you really notice, unless you're really looking for it, or if you've seen this film, 5,000 times like I have. Alec assaults Natalia here, which is a short bit, but I think that it's here to really give you a reason to hate the guy, just in case you actually had sympathy for him earlier on when he was talking about his parents. Uh, I do find it kind of fascinating that he even tries this. Uh, I mean, Xenia and Oromov are still in the room, so it's unclear where he even wants to take this, but how he brings up Bond in the conversation is very telling. I get the sense that he is totally doing this so he can feel like he has one upon Bond, or feel like he's stealing Bond's thunder in some way way. I don't feel like this scene is so much about him being attracted to Natalia as such, it's more about Alec's complex with Bond. Fortunately, 007 intervenes before things can get worse on board, as he has <laughs> somehow gotten ahead of the speeding train with his tank. <laughs> yeah, you better be taking a glug of that thing. He then fires the cannon at the train, presumably killing the train driver in the process, who is just some old guy. <laughs> I'd have kind of loved it if this had been that Canadian general double from earlier, just to wrap up that little plot story. But yes, the train comes to a crashing halt and Bond is able to get on board, and I just love how cold and no-nonsense he is with Alec and Xenia here, while they're just behaving like petulant teenagers, rolling their eyes and letting Bond know how tedious they're finding this whole situation. There's a great standoff when Oromov appears with a captured Natalia behind Bond, and he has to make a choice between killing them or saving her, and he of course does the latter, and in doing so gives Oromov a not terribly showy exit from the film, and as Oromov dies here, I just want to talk a bit about how great Gottfried John is in this rather overshadowed role. I mean, Goldeneye benefits from an ensemble of some of the best villains in the series, and Oromov completes this film's perfect quartet for me. The word underrated gets banded around so much in Bond fan circles that I'm not so sure if it even has that much of a meaning anymore, and I think that that's a good thing. Like, don't get me wrong, there is a wonderful diversity of opinion in Bond fan circles. This is a fandom where you can take almost any element of any film, and there will be a dedicated following to it somewhere online. Yeah, even those! Gottfried John is seldom the first name on anyone's tongue when it comes to talking about the positives of Goldeneye, and yet I have never actually heard a single bad 
bad word said about him or this character. He's just such a fun, villainous presence, and he plays this to a perfect T. It's just one of those performances that I want more of. I feel like there's just so much more going on with this guy than what we see on the screen. Just details like how he's clearly been drinking heavily when he realizes Mishkin has been talking to Bond and Natalia. I'd just love to see him getting that call early that morning of what his reaction would be. This really could have just been a functional and unremarkable role, but John brings so much character and understated humor to it that it makes him so memorable. I'm just in awe. I love this character. Anyway, back to the train where we have a great tense scene as Bond tries to find an escape route while Natalia traces Boris's location to find out where Alec and Xenia are heading next. Love some of the back and forth between Bond and Natalia here. What else do you call your bottle? What? It's Boris's password. He plays word games. It's what I sit on, but I don't take it with me. Chair. Like I said. I really love the building tension in the music, with the clock ticking down before the train explodes and the spike telling them where Alex's base is. It's such a cool scene. Love Bond's laser watch, just one of my favorite Q gadgets ever. Love this shot of the pair fleeing the explosion, and it turns out that Natalia has developed a kink for near-death experiences as she and Bond decide now is the right time and place to make out. It's a bit of a stretch, really, but I appreciate that after the day the pair have had, they may well want to let off some steam. I just hope for their sake that there's no one else on that train. <coughs> oh hey guys, you need any help? Everything moves to Cuba for the final chunk of the film, as Bond and Natalia head there to scope out Alex's base of operations, and oh hey, the BMW Z3 is here! I really can't wait to see those Stinger missiles put to use in good timer. Wade appears again to drop off some intel and a package from Q, which is weird, like wh why couldn't the package just come with the Z3? Why did Wade need to deliver it? But anyway, Bond exchanges his car for Wade's plane, which... Seems like a bad deal, but also Wade drives the car off and we don't see it again for the rest of the film, so what the hell was the point in bringing it to Cuba to begin with? Well, I mean, yeah, that's obviously the reason, but it doesn't mean that the car doesn't stick out like a sore thumb. It's so clunky that there is this big setup for it earlier on in the queue scene, and then we have absolutely no payoff. We never see this thing in action, and that's such a disappointment. Interestingly enough, you can see some snippets of what they did have planned for the car in the behind the scenes on the Blu-ray. There was indeed intended to be some kind of a chase sequence utilizing the car, as well as helicopters equipped with buzz saws, which would, of course, be a concept that would go on to be used in The World Is Not Enough instead. This is a prototype of a machine uh, used to chase Bond by one of the villains. It's, uh, it's what I call Meccano model, really. Trying different configurations of blades, sizes of blades, um, to make it look as mean as we possibly can. It soars through both ends of a bridge. It chases him through all the trees. Ultimately, he's trying to saw him into pieces. Just give it a little run up. While I am disappointed that the car doesn't really get a chance to shine, nor an opportunity to join the hallowed halls of the best Bond vehicles like the DB5 or the Lotus Esprit or the Vantage, I do appreciate that we did get that really cool kick-ass tank chase, and maybe that's one vehicle chase enough for this film. Bond and Natalia head to a local scenic shack for the night, and like all couples on holiday, get into a bit of an emotional balmy. But seriously, I really like this scene, and it's one that Brosnan cites as being one of the main incentives for him to do the film in the first place. For me, the challenge was always trying to make him real, real for myself, without the interference of Connery over here or Moore, or, and trying to please everyone. Uh, so you can only go to what Fleming put down on, on the page, and yet it had changed so much from what Fleming put down as well in the humor, the light humor that was put in there. So. I found a handle on Goldeneye. I found one scene where I really kind of believed in it, and that was on the beach with Isabella Skorupko, because the man is at his wit's end and he's been betrayed by a friend. And that was an emotional hook for me. And I, when I found that in the middle of the text, I kind of hung on to it throughout. And that's what I try to do, because it's so hard to believe in it at times. It's such a, it's, <laughs> you know, this whole idea of getting you know, mean and tough and sadistic in this crazy fantasy world is ridiculous. But I have to believe that Bond exists, and these kind of men, they do exist. 
not on such a grandiose level as Bond. And yeah, it is obviously a more character-driven scene. It's Bond having a moment to reflect on what it means to be up against a former friend and colleague and what that betrayal means. He has very few words in the scene and it is Natalia bringing this out of him, filling in the gaps as it were for the audience. I really like the scene and I think that Brosnan and Skorupko do terrifically with it. I can totally see why Brosnan would cite this out as a particularly memorable scene performance-wise, but then at the same time, I think he's pretty damn phenomenal through all of this film. I also love the follow-up scene with Bond and Natalia in bed. I think that these two actors have such a wonderful romantic chemistry and they feel so natural together. I don't get the idea that Bond is falling in love with her, like Tracy or Vesper or well, either of those two, but they do feel like a real couple, an astonishingly attractive real couple, but a real couple all the same. The next day, the pair head off to find Trevelyan's dish, not having much luck and even contemplating giving up on the search. Maybe Wade was right. There's no dish. So it's a damn shame for Alec that a missile fires out of his base to shoot down the pair. I don't know if we're to think that this was an automated thing or someone was specifically targeting them, but if they'd have just let Bond fly by, Alec might well have had a chance to get away with this whole bloody thing. But as it stands, the pair crash in the jungle and, well, I guess someone somewhere got a notification because this is when Xenia drops in to finish off both Bond and Natalia. I love how dazed Bond is through this bit. It certainly gives him a bit of an excuse for not putting up more of a fight. I mean, why isn't he using his damn hands, for Christ's sake? Fun fact, if you're watching this film on the original UK VHS or Special Edition DVD, then you will not have Xenia headbutting Natalia in your cut. The inclusion of that specific moment, as well as a few other minor things, led to the film being reclassified when it came out on Ultimate Edition here in the UK. It went up from a 12 rate rating to a 15 rating. But I'm really glad that it got reinstated and I like that Natalia puts up a bit of a fight because without it, it looks like she just remained passed out throughout the whole thing. So it always felt slightly weird that she gets up and then just doesn't question Bond as to what the hell just happened and why is that crazy lady dead in a tree? Anyway, Xenia does die here, suitably being uh, suffocated, crushed, uh, whatever it is, it's a brutal death and my only tinge of sadness is for the fact that this legendary character is now out of the film, and just to talk a bit more broadly about Famke Janssen and Xenia while we're here, I can't express enough how much I love this character and how this performer plays her. Yes, there are several similarities between her and a similar sexy psychopath lady from Never Say Never Again, Fatima Blush, and you can make the claim that Eon basically stole that character and put her in here, but whatever, I don't care because she is one of my all-time favourite Bond henchman characters. Just up there with the likes of Jaws, Oddjob, Baron Samadhi, Mayday, she is absolutely classic. Just the unrestrained glee with which she carries out the most awful atrocities makes her such a fun villain, but also scary. Like I say, the Seven Iron Massacre is really chilling, and she's damn frightening in that moment, and it can be a hard thing to balance, but I think that there's just the right concoction of camp and menace that make her an all-time great Bond character. I've seen Famke Janssen in many films and I like her in everything I see her in, but this for me is her iconic role. Sorry, Jean Grey and Liam Neeson's wife. So that's two villains down and two to go, so it seems fitting that much like Orumov and Xenia activated the golden eye earlier, it's now down to Boris and Trevelyan who reveals his massive dish for all to see, and there's definite echoes of classic Bond villain bases here, just the hidden in a crater aspect is kind of like the Eon Live Twice volcano base, and then the emerging from the water is like Atlantis from The Spy Who Loved Me, and there's just some terrific model work here, but also the fact that this was in part an actual location that they filmed that just brings the whole thing together so well. It blends really nicely. It's lovely stuff. By the way, speaking of model work, I do wonder sometimes if the Earth model that they use for the space shots is the same one that they used in Moonraker. I just love how dark and blue it is. It's not very realistic, but I don't care because I just love the look of it so much. And I also just love the idea that model supervisor Derek Meddings was dusting off old props from decades ago and giving them another moment to shine here. Bond and Natalia make it into the base, but 
car quickly rumbled, though Natalia does manage to sneak off to the mainframe computer while Bond sets some timed mines. Great micro moment here when he just casually flinches in response to some bullets whizzing by. I love how, I mean, aside from the armed Russian-speaking personal army, a lot of the people working in Trevelyan's base just look like normal people with desk jobs. It does beg the question how many of them ended up here. Like, did Alec have to recruit everyone personally? Do they even know what they're doing here? Like, what do you say at the interview when the intense, scar-faced man asks you where your loyalties lie? Uh, Yorkshire? Perfect answer, lad. You're hired. It's also a little odd that no one at all is questioning the stream of red flammable liquid that is now pouring out of tanks due to the bullet exchange. But anyway, Bond and Alec have some nice tense dialogue here, and I love Boris just being in the middle of all this, just giving sly looks back and forth like he's thinking, oh, some shit's gonna go down now. Alec also gets one of my favourite lines in the film here. What if you find forgiveness in the arms of all those willing women? all the dead ones you failed to protect. Natalia is captured, and her and Boris being reunited is just such a funny contrast with Bond and Alec. Like, those two just stood there sniping at each other and being all witty, whereas Natalia just goes and decks Boris immediately. It's great. Anyway, Natalia was able to rumble the whole operation by setting the GoldenEye satellite to burn up somewhere over the Atlantic. Boris tries to undo this, of course, and while doing so, fiddles about with the nearest available pen, which, what do you know, is Bond's exploding Q pen. It doesn't feel terribly random, though. I mean, We've seen Boris fiddling with pens throughout the film, and it's a very much a classic setup and payoff thing, but it makes it even more frustrating, really, that in a film with so many nice little setup and payoff moments, the setup of those bloody stinger missiles never comes back. Just adore this scene, though. I think the music works brilliantly. The callback to the train when Bond said Natalia meant nothing to him. Bond with the gun in his face while he's trying to count the clicks of the pen. Boris totally losing it with Natalia. It's just another brilliant scene for me. And when the explosions do get going, I mean, this is just great, like, just fireball carnage stuff. Bond and Natalia escape and then part ways so that Bond and Alec can have a proper cat and mouse type chase and fight across the antenna. Just a sidebar on Trevelyan here, I generally think that Bond villains fall into one of three categories. Rich megalomaniac, evil organization head, and the more nebulous dark side of Bond category. And Trevelyan is definitely in that latter grouping, I would say, and I tend to think he's probably the most successful of that designation. It's such a brilliant concept to have Bond up against a rogue 00 agent. And as I mentioned earlier, the fact that Sean Bean himself could have been James Bond really completes the mirror image appeal of this conflict. The original conception of this character was that that he would have been more Bond's mentor, and while I think that's still an idea ripe for execution someday, I don't think it's quite as effective as having Bond versus a genuine contemporary like it is here with Alec. I'll admit it's a little hard to swallow the idea that he'd be able to acquire the finances to carry out such a scheme as large as this. I mean, he must have been squirreling away that MI6 salary every month to afford a giant submersible satellite dish, but hey, maybe he has a room of diverting funds from the Russian government, or maybe he just had a very convincing pitch to investors, I don't know. DO IT FOR YORKSHIRE! What I do know is that Sean Bean manages to create one of my all-time favourite Bond baddies in Alec Trevelyan. I love his scenes with Bond in this final act, and this brawl is up there with some of the best, most brutal brawls in all of Bond. This scene for me is right up there with the fight with Red Grant on the train in From Russia With Love. It's that good. I love that Trevelyan gains the upper hand at one point, but even then he's beaten so badly he needs to support one arm with the other. This fight is so good, I love it, and just how it escalates to them actually fighting on the most precarious of spots in this place. It just continues to get more and more dangerous as it goes on. How the fight escalation corresponds with Boris's struggle to regain control of the satellite is really lovely as well, and how Bond intervenes in that in a more practical way by physically stopping the dish from moving is just wonderful. It gets him involved with all of that satellite stuff so that it isn't all just up to Natalia, who actually, by the way, does very well to scope out Trevelyan's lone gunship, who is summoned to, uh, to do what exactly? I mean, he can hardly leave the controls of the thing to try and shoot at Bond from a distance, can he? So I guess maybe he's just there to provide Alec with a second escape route, but I mean, hey, the guy doesn't need it in the end as Bond does gain the ultimate upper hand and we get one of the coldest villain kills in the entire series. For England, James? No. For me. Ah! 
I just adore the cut as well from Alex's body slamming onto the dish to Boris screaming at his screen to the golden eye satellite exploding in space. I generally think that the editing in this film is just top notch. It's credited to Terry Rawlings, who has done so many great films in his career, including some of my all time favorites like Alien, as well as Blade Runner and Chariots of Fire. and. Michael Winner's Bullseye? Uh, well, okay, I guess we all need to pay the bills somehow. It's so brutal as well that the film effectively gives Alec two deaths. Like, somehow he manages to survive the fall, and then he only goes on to be crushed by his own villainous lair as it collapses. It's really satisfying, as is the more comedic death that befalls Boris, who is frozen by an exploding burst of liquid nitrogen. Bond and Natalia are dropped off while the helicopter henchman makes an unlikely getaway. Alright, time to see if I can salvage my last paycheck from that burning wreckage. I really like this final scene, and it is something quite different for a Bond film, really. I mean, usually Bond and the Bond girl end the film actually having sex with each other or about to have sex, be it in bed or a shower or a raft. And sure enough, I mean, here they're making out, but they're actually interrupted by Wade. And I love the gag that the pair think that they're alone, but actually they're surrounded by Marines. I have no idea idea how they were able to set those helicopters to silent mode, given that they were just inches out of the shot. But anyway, again, to speak to what I feel is the very real nature of the chemistry between Brosnan and Skorupko, I love that they actually head off together laughing and joking. It feels very genuine and sweet and appropriate for this film. I wish the same could be said for the song that plays over the end credits. I mean, I'm surprised that people weren't trampled to death in stampedes as people attempted to flee cinemas back in 1990 from The Experience of Love, written and, God help us, performed by Eric Serra himself. Is it too late to take back the nice things that I said about the score? I need to know more about how this ended up being the second song of the film, who had pictures of who in compromising positions, I need to know. I mean, Goldeneye itself is a lovely song, and then you have the Bond theme itself. Either of those would have been perfectly fine ways to end the film. But the experience of love is just precisely no one's favourite Bond song, or second, third, fourth favourite, and it's just a bit of a dull note to end this film on. But fortunately, by this time, I've had a couple of amazing hours with this terrific film that even the experience of love can't sour the experience, despite its best intentions. So that is Goldeneye, a film that means so much to me and to many Bond fans around the globe. As well as I would say general film fans, I think it is one of those Bond films that kind of transcends the series and has a wider pop culture awareness and fondness, and I think that's a wonderful thing and a reason to really celebrate this film. I love that this film has a life outside of the box set, and yeah, I know that not every Bond fan shares the same level of enthusiasm that I have for it, and you know what? That's fine too. I'm a kid of the 1990s, and I have no doubt that nostalgia plays a huge part in my liking of this film, as I think it does with the majority of Bond fans. Like, chances are, the Bond that you grew up with and the first Bond film or two you saw probably hold a special place in your heart, and I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think that that's a perfectly valid reason for liking something. Goldeneye wasn't the first Bond film that I saw, but it was one of the first, and combined with the super fond memories that I have of playing the N64 video game, it is just a very special film in my Bond fanaticism. But I certainly don't mean to discredit what a belting film that I think Goldeneye is in its own right. I mean, the Bond cocktail is often mentioned in relation to these films, and, you know, the list of familiar elements that are so often combined in every film in this series. Martinis, girls and guns, villains, cars and gadgets, and all that. And for me, Goldeneye is just that recipe perfected. It is an ensemble of top tier characters from the main villain and female co-star right down to the allies and two scene characters throughout. I just can't get enough of these people. And then there's just the general energy that this film has. It feels fresh and vibrant and kinetic and that has never diminished for me over time in terms of pace, suspense, excitement, humour, I think it's just a perfectly constructed piece of narrative entertainment. And Now, of course, throughout this video I've poked fun at plot holes and contrivances, and you might be wondering how I can say that this thing is perfect despite those things. To that I can only say, whether you enjoy a film or not is not an exercise in logic. It's an exercise in rating your nearest booze outlet for all the contrivatini you can stock. But seriously, to a degree a film's leaps of logic are somewhat self-contained, and what might bother 
bother you in one film might not bother you in another if you're enjoying it well enough and you can just roll with it. I mean, I don't watch Jaws and then end the film with my arms folded complaining because you couldn't really explode a shark by shoving a canister into its mouth and shooting it from a distance, but because I love Jaws and I think it is a perfect film, I just roll with it, just like I think that GoldenEye is a perfect film. Yes, I made that equivalence and I'm standing by it. I can come back to GoldenEye over and over and over again and I am just never not entertained. I, every element that is in here coalesces, yes, even the music into something that just provides pure escapism in its most primal form, and I love it. In terms of the Bond series as a whole, it feels to have such an identity of its own to me. The, the next three Brosnan adventures, while all helmed by different directors, have a bit more of a house style feel to them, and the previous five films in the series before GoldenEye all being directed by John Glenn obviously means that there's more visual and style continuity between them, but GoldenEye has always just felt in such of a league of its own. Please do consider joining in the GoldenEye love in the comments section below, or even if you're not that big a fan of the film, let me know know down below. It's always good to hear a diverse set of opinions when it comes to Bond films. And while you're down there, you can click the subscribe button and the Mrs. Bell notification button to stay super up to date on future video uploads that I'll make on this channel. And as well as those things, there's links to my social media pages, so please do follow me on those if you care to do so. And until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.